My name is Jasper Hongerts. If you want to say it in a German way, um, you can also say Jasper or Jay or whatever. Um, whatever you mean. That's fine too. Um, I work for Airbus Defense and Space. Um, Airbus is the company that does the airplane stuff like Boeing does, uh, only it's the Europe European one. And I'm in the defense and space area, which means it's military aircraft and, and uh, space travel and ISS uh, rockets thingies. And in that regard, uh, I'm not working on actual military hardware or space hardware, I'm doing cybersecurity. So, um, incident response, network forensics. That's what I do. And um, I use Wireshark a lot. Have been using it a lot, uh, even since before it became Wireshark. I was using Ethereal as well. Uh, I was a trainer for quite a long time for Wireshark classes. I wrote a couple of them. And I'm quite well known to the developer guys because I come up with uh, requests and things that don't work. And a couple of them already have helped me, I think, to set up my Windows development environment at least three times. I think uh, Graham did. And uh, yeah, um, we're in constant uh, banter about things working, not working, them hogging my bandwidth when I need to download stuff in the night uh, for preparing presentations and stuff like that. Okay, um, Trace Wrangling. Um, who has ever heard of a thing called Trace Wrangler? A few, okay. So if I ask the other way around, like who hasn't heard of it, everybody else is raising their hands, right? Or are you still asleep? Okay, let's try this. Who hasn't heard of Trace Wrangler? Not bad. A couple of people checking their phones. All right, so um, Trace Wrangler basically is uh, a tool that I wrote on my own. Um, uh, and just during the keynote when Gerald was talking about how long it takes to set up a Wireshark uh, development environment, well, for me it's faster because I'm using something that's called Delphi or Delphi and uh, setting it up is half an hour. So. I'm good to go in less time, but I can't compile for the other operating systems, so it's Windows only, which is a problem sometimes. All right, so our agenda. Um, what is Stress Wrangler anyway? For, especially for those of you who don't know it, this could be interesting. For those who know it, maybe there's something in there too. Um, I'll talk about file and task concepts, um, because it's supposed to work on a lot of files at the same time and doing interesting stuff. Um, I'll talk about editing PCAP files, um, that's the main purpose of the tool. Um, extracting packets is something that I edit a little later, but uh, I use it a lot myself. And I have a lot of demos and scenarios because, as you might, may remember, I don't have many slides, it's just, I think, 25 slides or something. And there will be a short roadmap, which is basically just to let you know that I'm not uh, stopping to work on it, I will continue and add more stuff, um, we'll see about that. Okay, so what does Trace Render do? It's basically a trace file manipulation toolkit. Um, it can read a couple of file formats, um, basically PCAP, PCAPNG, and the old sniffer um, formats ENC and CAP, um, which is because I was working with those back in the days. Um, these days I'm not uh, really doing that anymore, but those are the four formats that I can read. Um, TraceRanger can also write PCAP files, but only PCAP and G, not PCAP, which is something that I get a lot of trouble for, because a lot of people want TraceRanger to also write PCAP formats, which I didn't do, and that was on purpose, because I wanted to start everybody to start using a new file format. Um, but in the meantime, I've learned that sometimes there is a reason <coughs> to uh, write PCAP format as well, so maybe I'm going to edit, I don't know. I think, Chris, you were one asking me about it. Like, can you please put it in there? Why not? Yeah. Um, what it does, it uh, basically decodes protocol layers and performs tasks like sanitization and anonymization. That was the first thing that it could do. So if you have a trace file that you need to give to somebody, but there's something in there that is problematic or sensitive, and you don't want the people that you're giving the PCAP file to to not see, um, you can remove that. And um, there's other tools that do that as well, but they were so annoying that I decided to do my own. Um, because when I was preparing captures for Sharkfest, um, I often spent days just to sanitize my key pickup files, and um, that is simply totally annoying, um, especially for me, and I know that most of the other pre presenters have the same problem, and trainers, and sometimes even people who just have to give a firewall trace to the vendor because the vendor says, hey, um, 
the firewall isn't working as it should, so give me a trace file. And then you say, no, I can't because there's sensitive stuff in there. So um, sanitization is an important thing that is uh, required every once in a while. So that was the first thing that it could do. Um, the second thing that I added, and I think that was probably also because of a Sharkfest attendee coming up to me and saying, hey, I've got this strange capture here. It's captured on a Juniper device, and it has a header that nobody understands except maybe Wireshark, or Wireshark does understand it, of course, because if Wireshark doesn't understand it, it's basically not a network protocol. So um, can you remove it because there's tools that don't know this layer and I need to work with it, and that was something that I added, so you can remove layers. Um, there's one project that I'm going to be working on, which is transforming Wi-Fi traces into Ethernet traces, so that you remove all the radio stuff and then you can go with Ethernet um, instead. Um, I haven't put it in yet, but it will be on the roadmap. Then one thing is uh, to extract packets or flows. Um, if you have worked with Wireshark a lot, you probably know that filtering on a packet um, is limited in a way that you can only filter on things in a packet, but not on packet relationships. So you can say, like, show me all the GET requests where the resulting return code from the web server was a 500 error. That is something that you cannot do in a filter straight away. It's, uh, you, you need to work with a couple of steps to get there. And um, packet and flows extractions is basically um, designed to help you with that and automate it in a way which I need a lot for uh, network forensics and it's a response. Then there's merging, which is like the ugly stepchild. It's only in there because I was annoyed with the merge cap um, not working correctly in an older version, which has uh, improved a lot since then. So this is something that maybe not, nobody ever uses now. Um, it's still in there because why remove code that works? Or it crashes sometimes, I found out yesterday night, um, and we will probably have a laugh about it, um, but I'll show you. So. It runs on Windows and Linux if you use Wine, uh, because it's written in Delphi and not C. And I get constant, uh, basically, trouble for that from everybody who wants to run it on macOS and Linux um, native. I'll see what I can do, but um, at least it's open source. So um, you could look at the uh, source code and uh, rewrite it to your own. But it's 200,000 lines of code, and it doesn't use any libraries from anybody else. Everything I've written is my own, um, so it would be a lot, a lot of work to convert it to anything else. So the uh, default question usually is like, what is the difference between Wireshark and Trace Wrangler? And I uh, made a list, and basically it means um, Wireshark and Trace Wrangler are both tools that can work together, but do don't replace each other or um, there's only a few things that they both do at the same time. Um, Wireshark has a lot of more dissectors than I do. I have 34, um, all written by myself, so um, it's a slow process um, because I need, need pack capture files to basically implement them. Um, I don't display any protocol decodes. That is what Wireshark does, so I have no need for that. So if you need to look at packet content, use Wireshark, not TraceRanger. Um, Wireshark can only open one file at the same time. If you want to have more files open, you need to run multiple Wireshark uh, instances. Um, I designed my tool to be able to have a file list that can hold hundreds and thousands of files. And the biggest one that I've done so far, I think I processed a task that had 500 gigabytes in uh, 1,500 files or something. And run one task against um, that set of files. It took a long time still, um, but it worked. And uh, working, uh, doing that with Wireshark would have been quite impossible. It just takes too long. So Wireshark has a lot of filters. Basically, I think, I don't know what the current count is, but the last one I heard was over 120,000 different display filters. Um, I think I have like a dozen or so, maybe. Um, basically, I can only filter on IP addresses, ports, and some other stuff. Um, not very important. Um, one of the things where they get into the common area probably is the conversation statistics. Who has used the conversation statistics of Wireshark before? Okay, so um, the conversation statistic in TraceRanger is pretty much the same, but it does the statistics for all files in the file list. So if you have hundreds of files, you can get a TCP conversation statistics. 
seeing who is talking to whom for every file combined. So if there's a conversation starting in the first file and ending in the last, you will have one line telling you the whole conversation is from here to there with everything. So um, that is quite useful for me. Yes. Yes, but is it separate um, multiple sessions with the same file structure? Um, yes and no. Um, the question was, does it separate multiple sessions with the same five tuple? Um, that is kind of actually a good question, of course, because it's from Saki. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, if you have a source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and TCP or UDP, that is called a five tuple, right? Everybody knows that. Or at least you know now. Yeah? Um, that is what makes up a conversation. But it could happen that somebody is using the exact same combination again after a while. Yeah, that is called what we call port reuse. And port reuse can be a problem. It can be especially a problem if you're not separating the two because they're two different ones. There's two conversations at one. And I have to admit, Trace Winger doesn't. It will basically keep the two conversations as one, so it, it thinks it's one. Um, the reason for that is um, that is uh, uh, quite complex to determine if something started new or not, <laughs> because then you need to look at um, is this old enough? Is this a new initial sequence number? Is the distance from the old conversation far enough for this to be a new one? And I've written code for doing that, and it works, but it's not in trace wrangler yet. Yeah, so I can do it, but not in the version that is out there. Okay, so we will look at the conversation statistics because it's the one thing that I use quite a lot, um, especially since you can um, extract conversations really quickly and look at them in Wireshark. Um, you don't have to gather all the packets yourself. And uh, Wireshark has no or very manual packet manipulation features. I don't know if the packet editing has made it into the G G QT version. Uh, Graham is shaking his head, so no. Um, the GTK version allows you in an experimental mode to edit packets in Wireshark. Yeah, you can do that, um, but it's just there as an experimental feature and um, not that powerful in my opinion. Um, so um, TraceWanger is designed to do exactly that and uh, manipulate packets and sanitize them and keep everything intact, basically. Okay, any questions so far? Who's asleep? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, people just did this like uh, sleepwalking, huh? All right, um, file and task concepts. Basically, what we have here is uh, to the right, that is how Trace Render looks like if you start it and edit a couple of files. Um, there's a file list, and you basically add all the files that you want to do something on. You can add them with buttons or with drag and drop and I have a slide about that so I won't go into this here. And then there will be a list of tasks. Um, usually, usually there's only one task that you want to perform but you could run a couple of tasks on the same set of files if you wanted to. Um, this is not working as good as I hoped it would be because uh, uh, sometimes you want a task to be performed sequentially on files and it doesn't do that, it just runs all the tasks against the same set of files again and again. Um, I'll see if I change it in the future. And then there's the file details pane which is the lower right. Um, it's like cap infos, if you have ever, ever seen that, it will tell you there's that many packets in the file, it takes that long, it's uh, in correct time order or not, which can be interesting during analysis. Okay, so the file list. Um, yeah, file names should be obvious. Oh, the projector is not as wide as my screen. Okay. Um, file size in byte, ki kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, whatever. Um, then there's the file format. Um, the file format is detected by file magic. Um, file magic basically means that um, TraceRamingo will read the first, I think, 12 bytes of each file and look if it's a PCAP, PCAPG, ENC, CAP, whatever file by looking at the specific bytes in the beginning. So if you have a ENC file and you edit and it's in uh, a PCAP file uh, or a PCAP and G file, it will detect the correct file format and work with it. So you can basically throw everything on it and it will find out if it's a capture file or not and accept it or not. 
So you don't need to care about the file extensions, which is a, if you're working with Windows, Windows is usually very file extension uh, oriented. So if the file extension is wrong, many programs won't work, but this doesn't care. It's just on Linux. I'm looking at the magic. Then we have an absolute time of the first frame in the file. Um, that is important um, because if you have ever merged or worked with a set of files where the order was um, rearranged, then you had sometimes negative delta times after processing the stuff. So if you merge <coughs> files that are in the wrong order, um, you have jumps in time in the file. And uh, TraceRanger, whenever you add a file, it will arrange the file list not by name, but by first frame time. So if I add a trace file that has a name starting with A and it's from today, and I add one that has a B that is from yesterday, B will be for A. Yeah, because it doesn't care about the name, it arranges them by timestamp, uh, which is the most useful thing, I think. Nobody needs the, time, the names to be correct. The timestamps need to be in the correct order. At least nobody complains so far. Okay, then we have a current task status. Um, that is important as soon as you run a task, it will tell you which files have been processed and which haven't. Um, it's not that important right now. So, adding files, um, quite simple. You can use the add file button to do that. You can add, use add directory. You can drag and drop, which is what I do a lot. So, um, basically I run it and then I drag and drop everything that I need onto it. Um, if it's a capture file, it will appear in the file list. If it's a task definition file, it will be put in the task list automatically, and then you can just run it, or it can use command line parameters, which a few people do, just running it. Um, I think Paul Offord, uh, with his tool, he's uh, using TraceRangner by command line parameters. You can even tell it to add this file with this task and auto run it, and then quit. So there's command line parameters for basically everything. And pop-up menu, um, of course, if you're on the file list, right-click which is a quite Windows thing to do, I learned from Saki. Nobody right clicks unless you're a Windows user, apparently. Um, right click is important in TraceRanger because a lot of context sensitive pop up menus are there. So, file scan process. If I throw a file in there, it will scan the file. Um, I think I'll just show it. So, if I run TraceRanger, it looks like this. Yeah, there's nothing in there. It will just tell you, well, there's a file list here, and you could put something there. Um, let's get some files. Demo. Mm. It's this one. It's just a short HTTP sample. I drag and drop it, and you will see that um, basically that was really fast adding it because it's a very small file. If I use a bigger one, um, it takes a little longer. What it does is it scans the file for a lot of details. It will pull out everything that is in the conversation list basically. So um, if you add the file a couple of times, it will reread the same details from a database, so it doesn't have to scan all the time. Okay, so um, one of the key things Stressvanger does is whenever you add a file, it will once read all the packets in there and extract details. Because then it can help you with tasks like, hey, I've seen this IP address in this file. And then you don't have to type it in manually, you can just pull it from what, you already, what it already knows. And, uh, the scanning process is configurable. Um, usually it scans up to 50 megabytes at once. Um, if I'm doing something um, above that, there's a setting that you can uh, set, which is in here. So I've set it to zero megabytes. Zero means scan everything. And usually it's 50. So if you add something above 50, it will not scan it um, to be faster. If you want to scan it, you can just press a button and scan the file. And um, what happens then with the scan is, that um, we will extract metadata about conversations. Um, basically, it will know every conversation that is in the file, where the first frame is, at which offset, where the last frame of the conversation is, at which offset. So I can process files a lot faster because I already know the layout of the file. It's not like I have to reread it all the time. I just know this flow starts at this location, at this offset, and if I, if I want to extract it, I can stop at that location because there's no more frames after this for that flow. Now that is uh, speeding up the processing a lot. 
Okay, so I already just showed that. Um, here's a slide that shows you the database. Um, by default, it's called traceintel.db, um, which is kind of not that good a name, I found out, because um, very often I'm looking for something called trace, and I, then I always uh, get to the database, and I don't want that. So I think in this demonstration, I already changed it to PCAP info or something that is uh, easier. And um, on the bottom side, you can see it's just an SQLite database where all the files that are in the directory have been scanned, and it tells you um, what the first frame, frame time is from when the file is. You can see IPv4 conversations. So it pulls basically everything out of all the files that are scanned and knows everything about it. So if I add a lot of files to Trace Wrangler that have already been scanned, it just opens the database and reads that instead of scanning the file again. Yeah, so I know a lot about the PCAPs without having to read them all the time. So, then there's a local database. Um, I think I can show you the live one. I use a SQLite Explorer add-on for Firefox to do that usually. I use one that is pretty big. I have a file set here. You can see there's a lot of files in this directory. They're pretty big. And I already scanned them, so I don't have to wait in this presentation to scan them all. So there's a pcapinfo.db or pcap, what is pcapmeta.db. And this is what the database looks like. So um, the simplest thing is the file is probably that has all the file names that have been scanned. But um, if you want to know what the TCP conversations are, here's all the data about TCP conversations. And it will tell you a lot of, uh, about um, what's in the file. So you have the IP version is version 4, source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, who is the client. And that is determined by looking for the SYN and the SYNX. So if I see a SYN, this is the client. If it's a SYNX, the other IPs must be the client. If I don't see any of them, the column would be empty, because then I don't know exactly who the client is. Then I could do something like, hey, if it's going to port 80, the other one must be the client. So that also happens sometimes in some places. Um, I can see how many frames are in there. Uh, uh, source to destination, frames destination to source. So it's basically the conversation statistics you know from Wireshark, but extracted once and put into the file. So I don't have to redo that over and over and over again. I just read the database and then I know what's in the file. And that is really helpful, especially since I know where the first frame is, first frame offset, last frame offset. So um, extracting stuff is really fast because I need to just go to the offset and get the stuff and read it and stop as soon as I'm done. I don't have to go through hundreds of files just to check if there's some more packets for this conversation. Yeah, so that is really helpful. Okay, so this is how a big database looks like. Um, and usually it is in the same directory as the files. So if you add a file, this database will create it in the same directory. The idea is that you can uh, co copy it together with your PCAPs. So if you're moving PCAPs to another location, just copy the database with it and you don't have to rescan them. Yeah, so that was the basic idea. And then I had somebody who said, well, um, I have USB devices or read-only devices that I can write the database to and then TraceRanger fails. So I added a central database path that you can configure in the preferences. Um, and what he does basically, I think he points the database path to RemDisk, which means it's gone after he reboots the computer, but he's not interested in the database. He only needs it during um, the processing. So you can put it in a central database, and I've done a screenshot for this. So basically, if I set the database path to, let's say, C users, Jasper, app data, roaming, tracing, interdb, um, each path will be, um, yeah, there will be an MD5 sum created from the path, and then the database file for that path has the MD5 sum, so that I know which database is for which path. And to make it... Uh, Readable for humans, there's a path mapping.txt which will tell you which file is for which path. So if you want to transport it with you, you could do that. OK, 
Okay, so this, this are the two, these are the two options that you have. So now for the tasks, um, because the rest is maybe not that interesting. Um, you can anonymize files. That's what most people do probably. You can extract stuff. Um, that is something not many people do yet, but maybe in the future. Um, edit files is just for um, removing layers and protocols and uh, rearranging packets. In merge files, nobody actually uses, I think. And then there's tools. Um, there's the conversation summary that I already mentioned. It's basically the same as in Wireshark, but for all the files in the set. And you can rename files and update the file timestamps. Um, who's ever had the problem that a file timestamp was not what he wanted it to be? Um, because I have that a lot. Uh, you're working on a, on a problem that was captured on, let's say, yesterday, and then I extract a couple of packets and save them, and the timestamp of the new file that I created is today, not yesterday. So if I'm looking at the files or at the file dates to find the stuff from yesterday, I won't find it because the date is today. Yeah, so just where you can um, update the file timestamp by looking at the first or last frame in the file and set the file timestamp to that. And since it's kind of annoying to run TraceVang just for that, I also made a small command line tool that is called PCAP Touch. You just say PCAP Touch this file, and then it will set the file um, date to the first frame in the file, or the last. Uh, it depends. You can basically set it as much as you want, or configure it to do that. All right. Well, task pins. Um, the tasks that you define are also stored in SQLite files, so you can copy them around. Um, they're in a subpath of user folder, um, so you can reconfigure that if you want to. And if you want to keep tasks, you can just import and export them. Um, that is something that I think uh, Sake asked me, like, uh, how can I keep a task? Well, right-click. Oh, right-click. Um, okay. Um, he's a Mac user, so he doesn't right-click. I do, I do right-click, but I expect all the right-click options also to yeah. be menu. It's basically my fault, because I didn't design it for Sake, so <laughs> that's all. <coughs> so it's not idiot proof. Yeah, it's not idiot proof. <laughs> I try to idiot proof it a lot. Um, so I told you it's 200,000 lines of code yet, or by now. Um, half of it is to make it idiot proof. Mm. Basically, it's just GUI code to prevent you from entering stuff that you shouldn't. And uh, it's a lot of work to um, keep, keep everything safe and usable, usable for everyone. So let's do some anonymization. Um, who's ever used it for anonymization? Trace right now. Just a few people. Okay. Um, who, who needs something for anonymization? That's good. That's why you're here, right? Yep. yep. Okay. Good. Um, so, basically, um, this is the most complex and most complete task so far. Um, it was the first ever. Um, the first time I presented it uh, to the public at Sharkfest, um, Hansang gave me $100 afterwards for Amazon, so he was quite happy with it. And he keeps telling people that he loves it, so... Um, that's kind of a motivation to keep going. Um, basically what it does is it allows you to remove sensitive stuff. And sensitive stuff for most people is IP addresses, MAC addresses, and payload. Yeah, that is the most important stuff that you can do. Sometimes people also want to replace ports, IP IDs, uh, some strings somewhere. Um, it can do a lot of that. And it is designed to help you to make it as painless as possible, especially for those who need to replace some specific parts and randomize others. It has a lot of options that allows you to do that. So you can go and say, I want this conversation, this specific IP port, IP port conversation to be replaced with this, and everything else needs to be randomized. So you can do that. Yeah, it's uh, just a setting that you need to do. And um, then you run it, and... In the end, you have to check if what you get is what you wanted. Um, if not, tweak a few parameters. And if there's something that you need that isn't in there, you can always try um, to contact me and ask for something that you need. And sometimes I will do it quickly, sometimes it will take a while. Um, I got myself into big trouble once when I said, well, um, this is a EDP-based protocol, right? So I can put it in real quick. And it turned out it was a nightmare because I had forgotten about IP reassembly. Who has ever seen IP reassembly? Um, a few, okay. It basically means that one UDP packet is not one UDP packet in the trace. It means it can be a lot, so you need to reassemble it first. And reassembly is already complex, and that's nothing compared to TCP reassembly, which is a nightmare. 
and I haven't done it. So um, if you wonder about no TCP protocols on top of TCP being in the in the list of uh, protocols to the left um, of the configuration dialog, that is basically because TCP replacement is really, really, really hard to do correctly. Um, you need to arrange or change sequence numbers. Um, if you change the length of the packet, everything has to be moved, but only from that point on where you change something. So there's a lot of dependencies that you need to keep track of, and I haven't gotten there yet. Um, because uh, I have only so many hours in the day that I can spend on working on Trashwagner, and there's just not enough of them. So, I have a factory default, and the factory default is basically designed to be click and go. Um, if you want to sanitize something and you don't know what you're doing, the default should be okay. Um, I designed it specifically for the Q&A people at ask.yshark.org, because very often we have people who have a question, and um, they want to know, well, can I upload, or we ask them, like, can you upload a trace file, please? Because very often they will just give us a screenshot where they have painted over the IP addresses and stuff like that, and we're always like, eh, please give us the capture file because we need to look at things that you didn't think of. Yeah, I can remember how many times I, I needed to see timestamps, and it wasn't just in the screenshot, the screenshot. So what we do is we ask them, like, can you give us a capture file? And very often the answer is no, because there's something sensitive in there. So I wrote a blog post about how to anonymize and sanitize PCAPs, and basically the default set from TraceRanger is made to remove everything that could be sensitive, but keep everything in there that we need to help. And that means TCP and everything is still working as it should. So, and the default is designed to be as helpful as possible to the user and the analyst. Because in anonymization, very often you can remove too much, too much stuff and then nobody can work with the results anymore. Okay, and if you, uh, you can of course change it. So if you want to have a different set as a default, just um, do that. Um, there's a tools button that allows you to set a preset. And if you want to go to the factory default, which is my setting, you can also go back there. I will show that in a minute. So, sanitization. Um, many people don't understand how it really works because very often um, people think it's just, oh, if there's an IP address, just overwrite the four bytes of the IP address. Yeah, that works as long as the IP is exactly where you think it is, um, but if there's some layers before the protocol layer that you think where the IP is, everything gets moved backwards. So I've seen tools that even stumble across a VLAN tag because a VLAN tag means you have 32 bits more than you think you have. So everything is shifted for four bytes, and then replacing an IP address where you think it's at that offset suddenly replaces something else and everything breaks. Um, so sanitization is much more complex than most people think. What you need to do first is parse the packet bottom up. Start at the lowest protocol that you can find. Usually that's Ethernet or maybe Wi-Fi or something. And then you go up the packet, just like Wireshark does. Starting at the bottom, and dissecting everything. I'm saying parsing because dissection is what Wireshark does. I do parsing, just the naming convention. Then you need to extract all the values that you understand. And that is important because there may be values that you don't understand. Yeah? Um, if you've seen TCP options, uh, there are some options that are proprietary. Nobody knows how they work. And if you want to... Um, sanitize a packet, packet and you find something that you don't understand, you should drop it. And that's exactly what, uh, what Tracewinger does. If it doesn't understand something, it will not be in the final output in the end, because it could expose something. Because I don't, I don't know what it is. So if you have all the values, you throw away the packet that you just analyzed, and then you rebuild the packet from scratch, from what you pass from it. Basically, taking everything apart like Legos, and then putting them back, back together, and hopefully, what you put back together looks like what you had in the beginning, sort of. Sometimes something else shows up completely. So, um, the new packet is built top-down, from the top down, just like a TCP or IP stack does. It's exactly like an IP stack. Passing from bottom up, and rebuilding from top down, and then writing it back to the farm. So, keep in mind, everything that isn't understood by Tresswanger will not make it into the newly constructed packet. It will just be lost. Yeah? And if there's something that you need to keep that is lost, 
There's two options. Either you change the um, settings to keep unknown stuff, which is dangerous because that could expose sensitive content. Or you shoot me an email and tell me, hey, I have this thing here that is dropped. I need it. And here's the specification and the PCAP file. Yeah, if, you, if you can do that, and then I can usually implement it quite quickly. If you only tell me I have this strange thing, I don't know what it is, but I need to keep it, and I don't have a PCAP for you, and I don't have the specification, I'm probably going like, mm, okay, I basically can't help you, because I need to test it. Yeah? And that is, by the way, the funniest thing ever, if you write an anonymization tool. People complain about it not working correctly, and then you say, can you get me a PCAP? And they say, no, it needs to be sanitized first. <laughs> so, yeah, Well, sometimes they send me stuff, so I have some interesting PCAPs nobody else has seen, um, but it's basically like a um, non-written NDA agreement between me and the people, so I won't share the PCAPs, but uh, it gets the results quicker if I have a PCAP farm. So, right now I can sanitize 24 protocols, and on the right I've just uh, put a screenshot of my source tree. There you can see there's a class assembly for all the protocols, like... Um, IPv4, IPv6, ICMP, V4, HRSP, HSRP, SRP, MPLS, NetFlow, stuff like that. And the most important ones, of course, are Ethernet, IPv4, and uh, TCP and UDP. Um, these are the first that I put in. Um, maybe you remember how many protocols I can parse. It's more than 24. That's because I have to write everything twice. I need to build this, the parser for a protocol and the construction thing for a protocol and sometimes I only have the parsing thing but not the construction thing. And the reason for that is that it's often much more complicated to build something that creates a protocol layer than putting it apart. If you think about DNS, that is quite a nightmare because there's this pointer thingies where they do like uh, a compression thing and to build that again is not easy. Um, it's a lot of work to get it correct and to get it uh, built correctly. And um, I'm still fighting with TCP sometimes because writing TCP options can also be quite tricky. Okay, so the most important setting here is the one in the red box there where it says remove all unknown layers and cut away bytes from packet. If you uncheck this box, all the stuff that Tresseringer doesn't know will be kept. Which means if you have something that is sensitive on top of TCP or whatever, it will be in the resulting file. So if you remove this checkbox, you should be sure that there's nothing exposed in that stuff. Okay, so you can remove it, but then you need to check your resulting file very, very thoroughly to not expose anything. Yeah? This button basically means if, uh, if uh, Tracer doesn't understand something, it will be cut away. So now, enough talk, and let's do some demo. Um, it's much more fun than uh, watching people falling asleep while I talk. So, who's awake yet? Still? A uh, few. Okay. All right, I already added this uh, sample here, and the simplest thing to do right now is just to go here and say, anonymize. And you can see here, now I have this big dialog where you can configure everything. This one is the one I was, was just talking about. Um, it usually should stay in there, as I already said. And now uh, there's something that may be surprising, because um, there's some protocol names here, but um, not all of them are listed. You've seen there's 24 protocols, but for example, ARP isn't in the list. Why not? Why isn't ARP in the list? It's an important protocol, right? I mean, it's gone with IPv6, but until then, we still need it. So why isn't ARP in the list? Louder? It's on the right, is it? No. Basically, the reason for that is that what, what is in an ARP packet? What do you carry in an ARP packet that needs to be sanitized? MAC addresses and IP addresses, right? So basically, the list here on the left is not about the protocols, it's about the fields that you can find in protocols. So if, you, if I set something in the Ethernet thing, like the default is to process remaining MAC addresses and randomize them, so every MAC address will be randomized, 
And if it's found in an Ethernet header, it will be randomized, but it will also be randomized if it's found in an ARP protocol or any other protocol. So as long as TraceRinger knows, oh, this is a MAC address, it will be affected by this setting. And the same goes for all the IP settings, um, everything. So if it finds something, like if it finds an IP address in a TCP header, who has seen that before? Like an IP address in a TCP header? Because I have. Yeah, there's a thing called Citrix, you probably know it. It's one of the worst protocols to analyze if you are doing network analysis. Um, they have an option where they can put an IP address in a TCP option field. Okay, and uh, this is one of the things that get exposed quite easily by anonymization tools if they don't know that this is the case. Yes? Can you provide a list to randomize from so that there might not be any overlap? Do I provide a list? Can you provide a list to the randomize so that in case like you have a 10 network that's yeah. where you really define the normal overlap with something else? Yeah, it does that automatically. Okay. Um, I will explain that when I get to the IP address uh, range here. Um, let's just take a look at IPv4 because that's the most important thing. Um, here's something that basically I wanted to show Hansan, but he isn't here, so um, bummer. Um, you can see that there is a list of two IP addresses on top um, where 192.168.124.100 is replaced with 192.168.01. And that was put in there automatically. Um, because Hansang, he likes his client IPs to be 192.168.0.1 and the server IP to be 10. something. What TraceRanger does is, I started the anonymization task and said, I want to set an anonymization task. And then it looked at the database that it has and it sees, well, there's only one conversation in this file, only one TCP connection. So it extracts the source and destination IP and automatically adds a setting to replace them by those favorite IPs of Hansang. Can you change those favorite IPs? Um, not right now, but I will add the option. Well, this is the question was: Can you change the default replacement for those? So, if you like, like 172 something for the client, always. Um, right now, you can't because it's in the code. Um, but I will add that at some point. Yeah. The reason for that is writing this GUI settings code takes forever compared to just doing it in the code on replacement. So it's a lot of more work just to add the clicky thingies and the checkboxes and everything um, compared to actually doing it, which is why I haven't so far. So this is what happens if auto mode is enabled. When auto mode is enabled and you open a new anonymization task, it will automatically replace those two or add a setting to replace those two if there's only two IP addresses in the file. Yeah? And the client is determined by looking at who sent the SIM or who's talking to port 80 and stuff like that. So when I know or I can guess who's the client, this will happen. If you add a trace file that doesn't have a SYN or SYNAC in there and I don't know what it really is, this won't happen. So it's kind of a uh, magic thing. Not really magic, but it's just a little helper because the, uh, um, trainers and, and uh, presenters often only have a single conversation that they want to show and this is just to make it quicker to sanitize stuff. So, what does this mean? Um, if I find those two IP addresses, they will replace with the specific values. I want this IP to replace with that IP, and it doesn't matter if it's in an IP layer, or in a DHCP field, or it, uh, it just doesn't matter. It will be replaced with that value. So, when it finds 192, 168, 154, 100, it will be replaced with 192, 168, If it finds something else that is not in this list, what will happen? TraceRanger will look at the subnet list and check if, it's, if there's a subnet definition that tells it what to do with it. So if there's not an IP to IP replacement rule, it will look at subnet replacement rules. Right now there's none, so it will skip over that. And then it will end up at the last checkbox here, which says, oh, it's already zoomed in, process reminding IP addresses, randomize. That means if there's an IP address found that is not in any of the lists where, where there's a very specific rule to replace this with that, it will just randomize it. And as you know, an IP address is, or IP before, is 32 bits, right? Four bytes. And if you randomize it, what will happen? You'll get into trouble probably because um, 
there are some reserved IP ranges, or you can have a private IP address that is not a public address, or your IP address may end up as, as broadcast address or multicast address, and that isn't good. So what you can see here in those settings is that wire uh, that I keep saying Wireshark it must be because of Sharkfest. Um, the trace ranger is hard coded to avoid that problem. So if you're randomizing stuff, it will make sure that the result still makes sense. Yeah, and the default is that you can say for private range mode here, so if you have a 192.168, it will randomize it, but it will be once again a private IP address. So it will be a 10 dot something or 172 dot something, but it will not become a public IP address, it will not become broadcast, multicast, whatever. It will stay a private IP address, just a different one. Okay, and that is something no other tool does. They are all like randomizing stuff and, well, if it's a bad IP address in the end, who cares? And I have to admit, um, it happened to me as well. I have uh, another talk, I think, today about TCP um, uh, uh, analysis and I randomized my traces and one of the IP addresses ended up a little broken um, because I was coding some bad stuff. So, I will talk about that then. Yes? Uh, if the original IP is a gateway IP, for example, um, has there ever been any need to, to establish wildcards for the last octet, for example? Um, you can do that manually. So, if you need to keep it in a certain um, way, um, that is something that you need to do yourself because I can only guess as much. So, at some point, um, I cannot guess that this is a gateway IP address. So, um, that would be something that you would need to define yourself. Yeah, that's why there's enough uh, specific options to do that. So, um, I can do a couple of things, but not everything. Thank you. Yeah. So, once you've established this and you run through, is it do you have in a database or somewhere else a mapping of those? Because often, like you say, we'll have a very tight trace with two or three clients in it, and we, if we randomize it and send it to the vendor, it'd be nice not to have to then open that trace up and you know basically have to manually go through and say, here's the map of this is my client, this is my server, and then tell my internal guys, well, what he says, what yeah. he wants to say, he means this is a client. This is a so basically, if I understand your question correctly, and let me rephrase it, um, you, you want to know if there's a mapping that tells you if you look at the randomized file, what were the original rates, right? Yeah, you can do that because um, there's a setting in here, in the settings page. There's a so-called randomization database. So what happens if I find an IP address that I need to randomize, let's say I need to randomize it. It will be randomized. And then I will store the original and the randomized result in the database. Because the next time I see the same IP address, I cannot randomize it again, right? I need to replace with the exact same thing that I used before so that they stay consistent. And that's in the database. The database gets wiped after the run each time unless you check this and say put it on disk because it's a memory database usually, but you can force it to be put on disk. And if you do that, you can also say keep the database file after the task finishes. And that has two main reasons. One, you are able to establish a backwards connection and you can check if this IP was that IP in the original. And the other thing is that if you run, if you want to run the same replacement on different files, like a day later, and you want the same results, especially for randomization because everything you define specifically will be the same if you use the same task file, um, if you use the same database, it will end up in the same way. Yeah, so you can do that, absolutely. All right. Okay, so um, for private range mode, you can also say, well, randomize in the full address range. So private addresses could become a public IP address. It's all up to you. And uh, do not randomize basically means um, keep private addresses as they are. Which means if I find an IP address that is a public IP address, it will be randomized. If it's a private IP address, it will just stay the same because nobody knows where it really is. Yeah, so if you're fine with having your private IP addresses exposed, but not the other ones, go ahead and do that. Yeah? Um, the same can be done for 
multicast, a PIPA, and documentation IP addresses. Let's check those. Multicast, everybody knows what multicast is, right? What's a PIPA? Who knows what that is? That is the private IP address range you get if you do DHCP and it doesn't work. 169.254. something. That is called an IPPA address. If you get one of those for an analyst, that is quite interesting because you can see, oh, DHCP didn't work. If I would randomize them, you would lose that kind of information. Yeah, it would be gone in the randomized trace file or the sanitized trace file. So by default, those will not be modified. You can force it to if you want to, but it's not the default. And that is on purpose, because if you have a, an IP address like that, it's not exposing anything except that your DHCP doesn't work. Yeah, so these are the things, and even documentation. Um, do, did you know there's an IPv4 documentation range? It's reserved for documents. If you write like an example, you can use the IPs from the documentation range. It's, I think it's 198. something. Yeah, it's the same in, in IPv6. They have 2001. Dot, uh, colon DB8. That is called a documentation IP address, and it's not supposed to be used in the real world. It's just for giving examples. And if you have something like that, you can still say, please keep it as documentation. So what is it exposing? It's nothing. Yeah? Um, so there's a lot of automatism or automatic stuff happening in here that tries to make it easier for you and not think about so many things. Yeah, because most other tools just replace everything like they don't care. And I can't, that's not really useful. What we need, especially for the Wireshark Q&A side, is that we can still tell that there was a problem like, oh, DSCP doesn't work, or this was an appear left like this, or like that. So the randomization here is made to not expose critical stuff, but keep everything that is like an error situation intact. Okay, and then there's the special one, um, checksums. Um, who has seen a broken checksum in a packet before? The rest hasn't? Really? Okay. Um, how common are broken checksums in packets? That is a trick question, because it depends on how good you capture. Um, if you do a local capture, like if I would capture on my laptop, I would have at least half of the packets having a checksum error, or maybe even exactly half of the packets, because everything I'm sending will not have a correct checksum. Um, and when I did this here, like um, recalculate the checksum, because if you're changing the packets and if you're replacing IP addresses, the checksum will be bad, right? So we need to recalculate it. But it should stay bad if it was bad, because otherwise, in the end, if you give someone the trace file, you can, he cannot tell that the checksum was broken. So how do you do a broken checksum? Any ideas? How, how would you do a broken checksum? So you want it to be broken deliberately. It's not as easy as it sounds. I was doing like, hey, just let's randomize it, it will work. But what happens if, by chance, I hit the exact correct CRC when I randomize? it will be okay, right? And then the problem is gone from that packet. So what I do right now is I calculate the correct checksum and add one. Then it's broken, no matter what, okay? So if you see in Wireshark, checksum is broken, it should be this, and you see it's one higher than it should be. It's probably because it has been trace rendered. Sorry. Um, you can do a checksum recalculation by not calculating the whole checksum, but the, the distance vector. Yeah. That would be a uh, way to do it as well. Yeah. Um, that is an idea I already got from a couple of people who just said, well, if it's broken, make the new thing broken with the same distance from the original that it should have been, but I haven't gotten there yet. This is like a fancy bell, a bell and whistle thing where I'm like, yeah, I have other things to do first. Yeah, it's a great idea, but it was like, ah, it's on my bottom of the to-do list because other things need to be done first. Um, there's one thing in here that nobody has seen before, um, even those who have used Trace Wengler. Um, it can now do 802.11 things. And the only thing that I added so far is that you can replace SSIDs. So if you have a wireless trace, you can change the SSIDs in the trace. Um, you can tell that it's not completely um, as comfortable as the rest. You cannot right-click in here and say, look up what is in the trace file. 
Because in most other situations you can do that. You can go for IPv4, for example, and just say, um, no, that was wrong, not here, go away. And you could say add and click here and say lookup. And lookup will give you a list of IP addresses that are in the current trace file list. Because I have this database, right? So I can tell you those two IP addresses are in there. And they could put something in there like I want to replace this one with 10.1.1.1. And as you can see, it is added, which is stupid because it shouldn't be because there is already one replacement in the list for the exact same original. So these are the checks that I haven't had time to add yet. So if you want to do stupid things, in some locations you still can. It doesn't make any sense to add two rules for the same source IP address or the same original. So um, you can do that if you want to, um, but I will remove or I will add more checks for that in the future to make it uh, easier to not shoot yourself in the foot. Okay, um, other things, well, basically, you can just click through it. There's two um, protocols on top of UDP that I can do right now, which is DHCP. Um, DHCP, the only option right here is to replace FQDN with a placeholder, which means it will be access, just xxxx.xxx.xxx, because replacing FQDNs is really a complex thing, because if you're changing lengths, everything gets kind of uh, problematic. And it's once again the DNS thing that I was talking about. DNS is very, very complex to, to sanitize, and I need more time to do that. And then there's RTPS, which was basically the thing where the guy told me, hey, it's on UDP, it's simple, just let's do this. And then it turned into a two-week full-time, oh my god, um, because of uh, IP fragmentation. Which basically means it's not just one packet that you have to look at, but you have to reassemble everything. Um, then sanitize it, then cut it into pieces again that should be exactly the same like before, they need to be in the same order, they need to be written in order with all the non-fragmented packets, so um, it's really a complex thing. Um, IP fragmentation looks very simple, but not if you're writing a tool like this. It is um, a lot of work to get it right, and I'm not even sure how much more trouble TCP reassembly will be, but I think it will be like a million times harder, probably. Because then I need to worry about sequence numbers and everything, and that is just really, yeah, something that I look forward to, but I'm scared of. All right, so let's just run it. So now it's done. It's as simple as that. Um, and now I have a new file that is called HTTP sample underscore anon. If I double click it, I should see that the P addresses have been replaced. According to my specifications, you can see there's 192.168.0.1, 10.10.10.1. Everything is cut away. Um, you can't see any HTTP anymore. So if we take a look at the original, it should be easy to see that there's a difference. Now this was the original. You can see here that there are HTTP GET requests, uh, 200 OK, um, there's stuff in there, and up here everything is cut away. Why? Because TraceFangler doesn't understand HTTP right now. Yeah? Understanding HTTP is not really complex. It's a simple thing because if you know HTTP headers, for example, it's just a, a list of strings, basically. But if you want to change these, um, you will change the size of the HTTP layer. And that means that you need to rearrange sequence numbers and everything, and that is why it hasn't been done yet. Yeah, but that is on my list. And the other very uh, well-known protocol that everybody wants me to do is SMB. Uh, and if you have looked at SMB, that is a nightmare in its own, or on its own. Yeah, because SMB is insanely complex. And to do that right, it will probably mean that I'm in retirement before I get it done. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so that is sanitization. Um, if you have anything that you need that doesn't work for you, um, the presenters very often come to me and say, well, I need this, I need that, can we do this, can we do that? Um, if I can find a solution for you, I will. Um, the last one asking me was Sake, and I implemented the change that he needed like on the same day. Uh, it was just, I think, randomization of MPLS labels, which wasn't in there. So now I can do MPLS label randomization. And uh, that is also more difficult than it looks because there are some rules to MPLS labels that I found out after just randomizing it over the full 
16-bit range or 20-bit range, and then, well, it was a couple of hours instead of just five minutes, as I promised, so I think, but in the end it worked. So, um, then I didn't need it anymore. And then he didn't need it anymore, yes. <laughs> because he had found another way of doing it. That's also what happens sometimes. Okay, so um, that was anonymization. Um, basically, play with it. Try it if you need it. And if there's something that is confusing or not working, or if it's crashing, which is entirely possible, um, just let me know. Yeah? And uh, if you can get me a trace file and the task definition file that you used, and then I can try to help you. By the way, what I wanted to show is um, how you can basically where is it? Um, change. If you, if you double click on the definition again, you can edit it. And what I often do is, um, if I only need to replace like IP addresses, I use tools clear all settings. And what that does is it removes all the settings. So basically, if you randomize with a cleared setting, the output file will be exactly the same like the input file, but with all the stuff missing that it doesn't know on the protocol that it is able to parse, so that it's co more complex than uh, it seems. Um, so very often I do that, and then I just replace the IP addresses. Yeah, so clear everything, do replace, um, replace by list, add, and I couldn't do here auto, and then I just have an IP address replacement real quick and not changing anything else. So if we do this, okay, yeah, just run it again. I should have my no, the Wireshark is already closed. Why did I close all that stuff? That's stupid. Um, I need to find the traces again. This piece traces. So now this is the anonymized thing with only the IP addresses being changed and you can see everything else is still in there. So you can play around with the settings, change them, run the task again until you're fine with the uh, result. And when you do that, it replaces the original and on file. It doesn't give yeah. you an on one or not. Yeah, no, no, it replaces the original file, which uh, seemed to be the best thing to do. Um, because very often you just want to have an anonymized version of the original and not various different versions for anonymization. Um, what you could do is, um, if you need different file names, uh, there's an output file setting here where you can put in the file name. Yeah? So um, it's possible to change it if you need to, but very often it's just... I, I basically, I always use the default. I have one anon thing and I often see people posting trace files that still have the underscore anon and then I know, oh, it has been trace wrangled. Yeah? So uh, that is kind of nice. All right, so that was the anonymization. Um, now for something that uh, I edit uh, later, um, editing packets. And um, I use this screenshot to sh basically show you what uh, the main functions are. Um, you can remove protocol layers that you don't need anymore or that are um, troubling your analysis. For example, I have people or I had people who had a um, conversation that was running over GTPU, so it was tunneled over GTPU, and they wanted to have the in, in the inner conversation as the only conversation in the trace, not all the tunneling stuff. So, what you can do with the trace render is cut that away. And basically, I think I'll just go through that stuff. Um, it can do some things that the CLI tools of Wireshark can do as well. I don't know if you ever heard of reorder cap. Um, it fixes times that are out of order. So if you have a capture that is, has negative delta times, you can use reorder cap. And I often use it myself, but Tresvenger could do it too. And edit cap can also do a lot of things that uh, Tresvenger does. But the main difference here is that if you're editing packets and you're cutting away layers, um, it's once again more complex than some people realize because you cannot just cut away an X number of bytes at a certain offset without breaking the packet. And the reason for that is that um, you need to look at where the protocols start and stop. So you need to know here's where the GTPU layer starts, here's where it ends, there's where the next protocol starts and so on. And then if you're removing something, like in this um, packet here. This is a packet that has two VLAN tags in there. 
So if I just cut away the two VLAN layers, what would happen? I would have a frame that tells me it's an Ethernet with a next protocol type of VLAN, but then there's ARP. So it would break, right? So what TraceRinger does it, it will go through the packets, remove the layers, and fix the other type. So the result would look like this. Yeah? This is actually an edited result where I just said, remove the VLAN tags. And it will fix the other type by what it found in the last VLAN tag. And a lot of the editing things is doing exactly that. They're trying to keep the packet valid by looking up the uh, protocol, next protocol things, and putting them into the right places. So once again, it's dissecting and reassembling some things. So um, I have a couple of files that I just want to show you quickly. Um, let's go. By the way, I have no idea where my, how my timing is right now. I'm probably waiting for time. The end of the first session is about now, I think. Yeah, end of first session now? Okay, good. That's... Uh, According to the cache flow. Yeah, okay. right. So what I have here, let's take a look. Who has ever seen a cooked header file? Those guys capturing on Linux would have seen those. They look like this. Let's just show it so that you know what we're talking about. There's only one packet in here. Yeah. Well, eh. I should change my profile to one you can read. Switch to demo. And then increase the font size so we don't need glasses. So this is what it looks like, right? You have the frame header and then there's no Ethernet, there's this thing. It's called a Linux cooked header. Um, and it's put in by Linux captures sometimes if it's unclear what the transporting medium was. So if you are capturing on multiple interfaces in Linux or on the any interface in Linux, you will get a cook capture header. And if you try to use this capture file with a tool that doesn't know what a cook capture header is, you won't be able to work with it. Yeah? And especially in forensics, if you're doing network forensics like finding bad stuff and finding out who did what, what when, um, if you have a capture like this, a lot of the tools will just say, I don't know what this is, because it's not Ethernet. What, what are you trying to do here? So what I need to do is I need to modify this cooked capture header to become an Ethernet header or Ethernet header. And that's what I can do with uh, TraceRinger, of course. So let's check. I just edit. I put a... Oh, that's still the anonymization task. Let's get rid of it. I put an edit task in there, and here you can see there's a edit layers feature, and you can say replace Linux cooked header with Ethernet, and then it will do that. And the interesting thing here is it will take all the values that are useful from the cooked capture header and put it into the new Ethernet header. So if there's a MAC address, and there should be, I think, I think there's just one MAC address in here. You can see that's a source MAC address. So it will take the source MAC address from the Linux cooked header and put it as a source MAC address in the Ethernet header, which is sometimes helpful. I don't have the destination MAC address, so I just put zeros in there. Um, but it's better than basically putting everything to zero. So if I run this, let's hope it works, because sometimes those things crash. I have the new version here. Cook it, cook it as an MP frame edited, something. And this should have now a pseudo Ethernet header. Where is it? Uh, it started again with the other profile, probably. Well, let's just go up here. You can see there's now Ethernet header, source, you will pack it something, destination 000. Um, basically, yeah, it replaced the cooked Linux header. So, a lot of the edit tasks are to help you remove stuff that you don't need at the, or that you don't want or that other tools can deal with to get to, well, the, the real things that you need. So it's a, basically a, a capture conversion tool. Um, i remove that one. Uh, let's add the GP, GTPU. I uh, should probably close. Uh, Here you can see, this is another example of something that 
sometimes it's annoying. Um, Ethernet, IP, UDP, GPRS, IP, ICMP. So if you only want the inner protocols, ah, so should I move it? Okay. Let's try it this way. So sometimes I want to have Ethernet and then the inner protocol layers. And basically that's what I'm going to show you now. And then I think you get the idea, and uh, I don't have to do it for all the other protocols as well, because the idea is uh, pretty clear, I think. So, once again, remove GTPU, and I don't need the cooked stuff anymore. Run it, and now I have another here and as you can see the tunneling layer stuff is just removed and it does that not only for single frames or one single file but for everything that is in the file list so if you have a ton of files you just run them through it and they will come out basically in the new format that you wanted do those tasks run for every single file in that list so if I, if I open them all up and kind of get an idea it's not just running for the file I've selected that task is running for everything yeah, it's running through everything. Yeah? Are the other details that show up, are they dynamic based on the stack that is analyzed? Um, they're dynamic um, by which trace ringer or what trace ringer finds in a packet. So if it finds there's a cooked header here, okay, and I'm configured to remove it and replace it, then it will do. If it finds, oh, this is an Ethernet packet already, it will not do anything. So basically what it again does, it reads the packet, finds out what it is, checks if there's something that you should do with the layers, and if so, it will do that. So sometimes if you check more than one editing feature, it will get into trouble because um, passing the modified frames from one um, removal thing to the next, I call it a chain. It's a chain of editing things that it should do. Sometimes that breaks, and um, I'm fixing that as fast as I can. So if you have trouble like this, um, I can recommend uh, running them sequentially, one after the other. And sometimes closing trace ringer too, um, because it uh, sometimes keeps things that it shouldn't. Um, but in the end, it should be able to do that on the fly with everything. Now, that's the main idea, but uh, sometimes, well, I, I find so many bugs in my stuff, it's amazing. Uh, sometimes I sit there like, how did that ever work? Uh, it is like this. I think it's for every programmer. And I'm not a programmer, I'm just a network analyst doing some programming. Okay? So, that are, those are edit tasks. Um, if you're annoyed by now and you're bored or want to change the room, please do. Um, if you want me to continue, um, just stay where you are and I'll show you the rest that I have. Can you do a short break? Hmm? Can we can do a short break, break if you want, yeah? yeah? Okay, let's say 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah? okay, 10 minutes.